We are still in the book of Hebrews, uh, so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Hebrews chapter 5, that's where we're going to be uh, this morning. Uh, we're going to start at verse 11, and we're going to go all the way in, into uh, Hebrews chapter 6, and depending on how uh, time goes, uh, I may uh, wrap it all up, or I might leave some and we continue next week. Let's just see how it goes. Um, the writer of Hebrews at this point, it, it's kind of weird, right? Like he's, he, he's had a, a pattern, he's had a flow from Hebrews chapter 1 and basically putting before us uh, the truth that Jesus is better, right? He's better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses and the law. He's uh, better than Aaron. He's better than all the priests. He's in the order of Melchizedek. We saw that last week. And so, so that's kind of the theme that, that the writer of Hebrews has been going on. And then uh, today, what we're going to see uh, in the text is he, he changes things in a very strange way. In fact, when I was reading it, I got to that point and I thought, hold on, uh, am I missing some pages? Like, it just feels like he stops doing what he's been doing, and then now he addresses uh, the, the, the Hebrews, he addresses us, and, and, uh, and it's quite intense, all right? Uh, it's quite intense, and, and so I'm going to ask you to have your seatbelt on. Um, it's about to get rough. Because we're going to see three things in our text this morning. Three things that the writer of Hebrews is going to bring to the surface. He's going to talk to us about immaturity. He's going to talk to us about ambiguity. He's going to talk to us about forgery that leads to apostasy. Yeah, my mom paid full price for this English. No discounts, no laybys, full price. Okay, so immaturity, ambiguity, and then forgery that leads to apostasy. And so uh, before we jump into the text, uh, let's pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do that which only he can do, and that is save many. Uh, and so, Father God, we come to you asking that you would do a great work in and through us. Uh, I ask that the text would be so plain to us that we would see you for who you are, and that we would respond accordingly. We are in desperate need of a savior. His name is Jesus. And so we thank you, Jesus, that you came and lived the life that we should have lived, died the death that we deserve, rose from the grave. And so even right now, you continue with your ministry by praying for us by name. Holy Spirit, would you meet us where we are? We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' beautiful name, we pray. Amen. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. He writes, we have a great deal to say about this. Now, now this, this is about the high priest, the uh, Melchizedek, all that stuff that we spoke about last week. And so if you missed that sermon, I'd encourage you to go and listen to it. He's, he's, he's saying, listen, I, I have lots to say about the Melchizedek and, and the high priest and, and how it connects to Jesus. And so we have a great deal to say about this, and it is difficult to explain. Now, if you were here last week, you, you might go, yeah, I agree. It, it, was, it, was, man, it was some interesting stuff, but it was kind of difficult, a little difficult. But, but then he tells us why. It's difficult to explain, not because it's hard, but the author of Hebrews says, because since you have become too lazy to understand. Uh-oh. Other translations say you have become dull of hearing or, or spiritually dull. Now, now, being dull of hearing is not a problem of the ears, but a problem of the heart. Yeah. That's what he's addressing. He's addressing the heart. See, the, the hearer isn't really interested in what God has to say. That's the issue. Not wanting to hear the word of God points to a genuine spiritual problem. Not wanting to hear from God, from his word, well, that's a spiritual problem problem. It can even be a reason for unanswered prayer. Proverbs 28 verse 9 says this, anyone who turns his ear away from hearing the law, even his prayer is detestable. I just, just, got, just got real, right? Some of you are wondering, it's like, man, I, like, are my prayers detestable to the Lord? That's a whole nother sermon for another day, um, and John is going to do it. <laughs> now, 
Let's remember the context that the writer of Hebrews is talking to. Things are tough for them. Things are hard. Things are challenging. Remember, the, the temple is not there anymore. There's, there's a lot going on, and, and they feel the pressure, and so they feel like giving up. They want to give up. And this giving up is because they are dull of hearing. They have become too lazy to understand. Now, this laziness usually comes first, then the desire to give up. That, 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 that's how it happens. It's laziness comes first and then the desire to give up. When the word of God starts to seem dull and boring and common, then we should consider that as a serious warning in our lives. If the word of God just becomes, oh, here we go again. Oh, I know, I know all of this stuff then we should consider that a serious warning. And so my question to you this morning is, are you there yet? Is this speaking of you? Has the word of God become dull in your heart? Is it boring? Is it common? The, 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 the word become is also important here. It tells us that they didn't start out lazy, but they became that way, hence the warning. And, and this is so common. It's so common. You, you cross the line of faith. You surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you, you are passionate about the things of God. You love God's word. You love to do the things that God says that we should do. You are the first person there every single time. You just can't get enough of God and his word. And then life gets real. And then all of a sudden, you find yourself sleeping in, showing up late, not really interested. You can't remember the last time you read the word of God. When was the last time I prayed? This happens. Friends, the book of Hebrews is filled with warnings. It's filled with warnings. These, these discouraged Christians, yes, they, they needed to be encouraged, they needed to be comforted. They needed to be taught, but they also needed to be warned. Yeah. They need to be reminded of the consequences of departing from Jesus. We need to be reminded of the consequences of departing from Jesus. Verse 12, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. Now, he, he's not referring to the specific gift of teaching that, that some of you may have. That's, that's not what he's talking about. He's, he's talking about the, the general role of teaching, that they ought to be teachers, in the sense that every Christian should be a teacher. Because every Christian should be making disciples. Did, 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 you, did you see that connection? Every Christian should be a teacher. Why? Because every Christian should be making disciples. Show me in the scriptures on it. No problem. Matthew 28. Verse 19 and 20 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. This great commission wasn't just given to just a, a handful of people. No, it was given to every single person that's crossed the line of faith. If you are a Christian, then you are called to be obedient to the great commission. And in that great commission, you are called to teach and so that's what the writer of Hebrews is referring to when he says, you guys ought to be teachers by now. A friend of mine, Joby Martin, says this. He says, the best way to deepen your relationship with Jesus is to help someone else discover theirs. That's the best way to do it. The best way for you to deepen your relationship with Jesus is to help someone discover theirs with him. 
We really only master something after we have effectively taught it and put it into practice. Let's be honest. And so by this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. See, milk, milk is used as an illustration to, to the basic teachings of the faith. Solid food is the, is the um, I have in my notes, meatier, but then I also realize that not everybody here consumes meat. So um, solid food is the more substantial material such as understanding the connection between Jesus and Melchizedek. He, he, he wants to go deeper into this stuff, but he's like, you know what? There's a massive problem here. You guys are struggling because you don't know Leviticus 16. And because you don't know Leviticus 16, you don't understand how it's connected to Genesis 14. And because you've never read Genesis 14, then when Psalm 110 verse 4 comes to play, you're like, what on earth is going on? You just haven't read your Bible. That's the issue. You, you, you're like, you just haven't read your Bible. And look, friends, it's not that milk is bad. That's not, that's not what he's saying. The, the author of Hebrews is saying that you should have added solid food to your diet by now. There should be a difference between someone who's been walking with Jesus for one year and someone who's been walking with Jesus for 10. There should be a difference. See, when... When a toddler does toddler things, we understand, right? We understand. We're like, we, it makes sense. They're a, a toddler. They, 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 they're learning how to walk. They're figuring things out. And so we respond accordingly. But when an adult acts like a toddler, then something is very wrong. That's the point that the writer of Hebrews is making here. And friends, there is a difference between a toddler and an adult in case you didn't know. <laughs> Let me give you a few. Toddlers, toddlers are driven by their emotions. I feel like this, and so therefore I want it. And I want it now, because I feel that way. They, they're driven by their emotions. Now look, I'm not saying that emotions are not important. They're there to help us navigate through this life, but we're not to be driven by our emotions. And your toddlers are. And so when a toddler is driven by their emotions, we go, it makes sense. When someone who's just crossed the line of faith, they've been walking with Jesus for one or two years, and they show up and they go, I, I feel like I need to be in this relationship. We go, okay, cool. We hear you, but there's some things that we need to walk through first. Come, let's, let's disciple you. Let's, let's walk alongside you. Let's, let's point you to Jesus and actually show you what he has for you. But when you've been walking for 10, 15, 20 years and you're still saying the same thing, that's concerning. To toddlers, here's another one. To toddlers have no concept of time. They just don't. They wake up and then just life just happens. You know, I'm not really sure when I'm supposed to eat, but I know the food will come. There's someone who's constantly caring for the toddler. As adults, oh, we need schedules, we need to plan, we need discipline. For someone who's just come to faith, it, it makes sense. It's like, what, was I supposed to be here? What time does this thing start? Is, where, where am I supposed to start? What's going on? Like, we totally get it. Hey, let's, let's walk with you. You've been walking with Jesus for 10, 15, 20 years, and, and you still show up after the fourth song? I mean, I, 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 I don't know. It's not me, it's the writer of Hebrews. <laughs> I'll give you one more. To toddlers are not aware of danger. They're not. To toddlers are not aware of danger. That's why for them, everything is awesome. I want to put my fingers there. I want to lick this. I want to go there. Why? Why can't I go? It's not fair. That's a toddler. Makes sense. That's why we're there to go. Hey, don't, don't, you'll die. Don't do that. <laughs> don't eat that. That's no. Please don't do that. Please don't go there. 
But an adult, imagine having to do that with an adult. Like if I'm there, like trying to, during worship, I'm trying to put my fingers in the thing. Like, like you, you guys will be looking at me like, what's, hey guys, what's wrong with Onet? Where was he last night? It's the same with our spiritual walk. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness. Because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature. And then hear this. For those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Good and evil. Good and evil. Both in the physical world and the spiritual world. Now, some of you, this is brand new to you, and that's okay. That's okay. There is a physical world, and then there's also a spiritual world. And, and, and the writer of Hebrews is saying here, he's saying, no, solid food is for the mature. It's for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. Now, it can be said that all five human senses, all five of them have their spiritual counterparts. We have a spiritual sense of taste. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Guys, we read that and we've got to recognize that, that that's that it's not just the physical, but it's going beyond the physical. It's talking about the spiritual because we're not out here going, I can't wait to lick my Bible and taste that it's good. No, no, no. He's, he's, he's calling us to more. Yeah, amen. We have a spiritual sense of hearing. Isaiah 55 verse 3 says, incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. Some of y'all have dying souls because you're not listening. We have a, a, a spiritual sense of sight. Psalm 119 verse 18, open my eyes so that I may contemplate wondrous things from your instruction. O open, open my eyes, Lord, so that I might see. We have a spiritual sense of smell. Philippians 4, 18 says, I have received everything in full and I have an abundance. I am fully supplied having received from Epaphroditus what you provided, a fragrant offering an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God, a fragrant offering. He's not talking about essential oils here. Yeah. Let me give context. He, he, he's talking to the church in Philippi going, you know what, and, and this is the passage that so many of us smash and grab, right? Yeah. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you're using that incorrectly, which might reveal that you're actually a toddler. See, if you, if you read that in context, Paul says, hey, guys, I've had a lot, and I've also had a little. But you know what? I know how to be content because God is my everything. And, and so whether I have a, a lot or whether I have a little, it doesn't matter. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what the text is about. Not like, hey, you know what, I'm going to go bungee jump. Hey, let's quote, I can do all things. No. We have a spiritual sense of touch or feeling. Ephesians 4 verse 18 says, their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. That our hearts have become hardened. Now, look, like, like physically, I don't know how you harden your heart. He's obviously talking about spiritually. Yes. Spiritually, there is a physical and a spiritual world. And these senses that the, that the writer of Hebrews talks about, he says, he says that they, they can be trained. They can be trained, which means that you can develop them. This requires intentionality. You, you want to distinguish between good and evil in the physical and the spiritual world? Train your senses. Yeah. Be intentional about training your senses. Yes. How do you grow and train your senses? Oh, I'm glad you asked. Let me quote Brother Lawrence here 
he wrote the book, The Practice of the Presence of God, and he says this. I cannot imagine how religious persons can live satisfied without the practice of the presence of God. For my part, I keep myself retired with him in the depth of center of my soul as much as I can. And while I am so with him, I fear nothing, but the least turning from him is unsupportable. He's saying, how do you you train your senses by being in the presence of God? But you've, you've, you, this requires intentionality. You've got, you've got to practice. You've got to practice being in the presence of God. H- how do you grow and train your senses? Be in the presence of God. Amen. Then you will distinguish between good and evil. Amen. Your eyes fixed on Jesus, then you'll be able to distinguish between good and evil. Be in the presence of God. What does that look like? Be in his word. Wake up in the morning, grab your cup of coffee or tea or water and just spend time with him. Be in the word. Pray. Spend time with the Father. Spend time praying to the Father in the name of Jesus by the power of the Spirit. And not just when like things are bad, You've got to develop a practice of constantly being in communication with the Father. When you get in your car, talk to your Father. When you walk into your house, talk to your Father. When you walk into the library, talk to your Father. Be in the presence of God. Practice the sacraments. The Lord's Supper and and baptism. These These are powerful things for the church reminding us of what Jesus has done for us. Be in fellowship. I cannot stress this one enough. Get in community. And I get it. It may not be this one. You might be like, mm, I don't really like this one. That's fine. Then go find one. Just be in community. We were never created to live in isolation. Yeah. And so, so part of us being in the presence of God is God going, listen, I'm gonna put a community around you. I need you to be in fellowship. So, so, so get plugged. if you're not plugged in, get plugged in. Yeah. Yeah. Bumi was super clear about how to do it. And I get it, I get it. Some of us were like, man, I've, 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 been, I've done the church thing, I've experienced it, it's a bit rough, and I, I totally get that. But do you, do you not trust God enough that he will heal you? Because if not, then we have bigger issues than you actually think. Be on mission. Uh, it's, a, it's a powerful of way, powerful way of being in the presence of God is to be on mission, is to trust him, is to trust him as you walk into the office, as you walk into your neighborhood, as you walk into the classroom, as, as you're with family and friends to go, you know what, I'm on mission. God, I want to share the good news with these people and then trust you that you will do a work in them. Yeah. Hey, have you ever been that desperate? Is there someone in your life where you're just going, i I, I will give up everything for you to know the Lord Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When you're that desperate, you're going to be dependent upon the Father and you're going to be in his presence. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last one. <laughs> Worship. Mm-hmm. Worship. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I get it. I get it. We live in a context where this is really common showing up on a Sunday. Like probably when you drove from your house to here, you drove past tons of churches with lots of cars there and people show up. And, and, and so in many ways, it's like, oh, it's pretty easy to be a Christian here. And then we normalize it. Yeah. And then you know what? We treat this, this Sunday gathering, we, we, we treat it like a TED talk. Amen. Let's, hear, let's hear what he has to say. Let's see, it's going to be interesting. Let's see if I can, you know, you know apply it to my life and, and see if that quickly works or whatever. Like, we, we treat this like a TED Talk, and then when, when the band is up there singing, we treat it like Christian karaoke. Right? We're somewhere in between a performance at f Stadium and Christian karaoke. Not recognizing that when we gather like this, friends, we are practicing what we are going to do for eternity. 
that, that all of heaven, all of heaven joins us, joins us. Like the angels show up and they go, what? Are they praising God? Yep, we're going to go there. We're going to be a part of that. Something happens here. When the church gathers, something supernatural happens and we've just normalized it. It's like, oh, that thing I have to do now. And, and I don't know, I don't know. I don't know if we're heading in this direction where, where someday we're gonna wake up and we're gonna be told you're not allowed to gather anymore. You're not allowed to open this up in public anymore. I don't know. Gosh, I just really hope that if that day comes, we'd be like, okay, it's cool. We're gonna figure out a way to worship because we are worshipers. We recognize who is seated on the throne. We just want to be in the presence of God. We need to train our senses so that we might distinguish between good and evil. So, so the, the author of Hebrews is, is going, hey, those who are immature, stop being immature and grow up. That's, his, like, that's the honor translation, and let's hope that that, that that translation never comes out. All right? But essentially, that's what he's saying. Those who are immature, those, guys, you've, you've been walking with Jesus for 10 years, and yet you feel like a one-year-old. You know what that means? You've, you've just been cycling that one year over and over for 10 years. <laughs> the author of Hebrews now goes a little deeper. Now, if you thought that was bad, okay, then I don't know. He goes a little deeper. And he's, and he's a little bit more frustrated. But it's a godly frustration. Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1, it says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Now, now if, you, if you read this in a smash and grab kind of way, then this will make no sense. In fact, I would probably call the author of Hebrews a heretic, a false teacher. But because he had root of fellowship, we read the whole word of God so that we might be able to teach the whole counsel of God. Let's slow this down. He says, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity. The, the, the New Living Translation says it this way. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. He's going, you're 10 years in now. You've been walking with Jesus for 10 years now, for 15 years, for 20. I celebrate 20 years next year since Jesus came and pulled me out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so, and so he's going, hey, hey, you, 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 you've been walking with Jesus for a while can you give me a little more than John 3.16? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying that John 3.16 is bad. It is, it is a beautiful scripture. But if you've been walking with Jesus for a while, could you give me a little bit more? Could you give me a little bit more than Matthew 6.33? Like, like, take me deeper. Like, like connect it to some prophecies. Connect it to what Jesus is doing in and through. Like, give me more. That's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. What is, what is God doing new in you? I love testimonies. I really do. They're amazing. Like, maybe one Sunday we'll do that. We'll just we'll take a handful of people and we'll get you up here and we'll tell us how you came to faith. Tell us how you crossed the line of faith. How you surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. I love testimonies. But what is God doing new in you? Like, give, give me a testimony of what he did in the last week. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you see the, the Lord at work in your life? And I'm not just talking about the amazing things, because that's what we, 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 we think. We go, you know what, Honest asking for like, what, what amazing thing can I share? No, 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 no. Maybe you come up here and you go, you know what, the Lord revealed to me that I'm greedy. Wow. That's the new thing that God's doing in my life. I am a, I thought I was generous, but wow, I'm greedy. I'm stealing, I'm stealing from God. Or maybe I'm, I'm impatient. 
I thought I was the most patient person in the world while the Lord really revealed to me that you have a long way to go. What, what is God doing new in you? Take, take, us, take us deeper. Take us de- show us that you, you've been walking with Jesus. Not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Now, at first glance, we might read these and think we're being given the ABCs of the Christian faith. That we should stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. And and that can be valid. That can be valid. However, I think something deeper is going on. While these are important doctrines, important biblical truths, I don't think the author of Hebrews in this regard sees them as the ABCs. And how do we know this? Well, because I I see no mention of Jesus. I see no mention of the cross. I see no mention of Jesus' resurrection. I see no mention of that. And, And while we can definitely make connections to those things, they're not explicitly here. Paul, Paul makes it very explicit about, about the ABCs. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 3 and 4, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance. Now, this should tell us that, okay, if there's first importance, then there's second importance, and third importance, and fourth importance, and so on. But, but there's something of first, first importance, something that, that Paul goes, you know what, man, if, if, if you have 30 seconds, this is what you give them. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in according with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. First importance. So if that's the case, then what's going on here in Hebrews 6? Well, let's remember the context. Because if we understand the context, it'll help us understand the text. The audience that the the author of Hebrews is writing to is a predominantly Jewish Christian community. That's who he's writing to. Many of them had come to faith in Jesus. But but now because of the the difficult times that they're experiencing, their faith is now wavering. And they are finding themselves slowly going back to Judaism. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, the writer of Hebrews says, hey, guys, careful that you don't drift. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't drift. I know times are hard. I know times are difficult, but don't, don't drift. Don't go back. The temptation is to, is to go back. The, the writer of Hebrews is saying, in the midst of trial and challenge, in the midst of persecution, stand firm. Yeah. Don't go back to the old ways. See, these Jewish Christians... They, they, they didn't want to abandon their faith in Jesus, but they did want to make it less distinctively Christian sure. and not have to deal with the call to persevere. Okay. Sure. <sighs> Let me try and unpack this. So, so, so to avoid persecution, because I can imagine there were, there, there were, there were those who, who had not come to faith who were going, We we told you. Hmm? We told you about this Jesus. Look now. Look at the challenges that you're experiencing. Look at the troubles that you're going through. Look at the persecution. And so to avoid this persecution, there there was a group of them going, you know what, maybe let's let's just live in the the ambiguous middle. Right? We don't want to abandon the faith. But also, this is way too hard. So maybe we can just live in the ambiguous middle so that we don't offend anyone. L- living in this, this comfortable, ambiguous, common ground, then, then no one will stick out. No one will stick out. You see, a, a, a Jew and a Christian, right, so, so a Jew, uh, one who had not come to faith in Jesus, and, and a Christian, one who had crossed the line of faith, 
they could together say, let's repent from dead works. They could say that. They could together say, let's have faith in God. They could together say, let's, let's perform ritual washings. Now, depending on your translation, some translations say uh, baptism. It's not quite the correct translation, all right? Because that's not, if you look at the original language, that's not the word that's used for baptism. It's not the common word that's used for baptism. Here, they're literally talking about ritual washings. Now, Jew Jewish people had ritual washings, ritual cleansings, like practices that they did that was not baptism the way we understand baptism today. Yeah. So, so, so it was easy to go, yeah, 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 yeah. Because in your mind, you're going, as a, as a Christian, you're going, no, but I, I'm talking about baptism, what Jesus has uh, commanded us to do, and, and a beautiful picture of, I've died with Christ. And like, that's what I'm talking about. But I'm not going to say all of that. I'll just say ritual washings so that they'll go, yeah, 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 I'm cool with that. They together could lay hands. They could together talk about the resurrection of the dead. They could together talk about eternal judgment. But, but here's the thing. When you, when you don't explicitly talk about how that's connected to Jesus, that is a denial of Jesus. The, the, these things that the, the author of Hebrews lists here, they, they were the things that were used to, to introduce Jewish people into Christianity. It was a, it was a way of, of connecting the dots, of going, okay, guys, like, I know we do these ritual washing. But I like to tell you that Jesus came and died on the cross yeah. and rose again. And so he is the first fruits. And so for every single person that surrenders their life to Jesus, which you should do, then the next step is to baptize you so that you can publicly, there it is, publicly communicate that you belong to Jesus. They, they would take these things, they, they, they would go, okay, yeah, 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 we, we, we repent from dead works. I understand, you know, the Torah talks about it, like these dead works, I mean, they're not, they're not really going to save us. But, but let me tell you, God's standard is still perfection, and we could not accomplish what he asked us to do. And so he sent his son Jesus to come and live the life that we should have lived, but then die the death that we all deserved because we could not keep the law. And so now we put our trust in Jesus, and so should you, so that you might be saved. They, they were used as, as an introduction to the Jewish community to point them to Jesus. And yet what, what they were doing was going, you know what, it might be easier just to, let's just, let's just be in this comfortable, ambiguous middle, right? Like, let's not, let's not talk about Jesus, but, but let's, not, let's, also not, like, let's not offend, let's, let's just be here. Yeah. It's comfortable here. This is, this is the characteristic of those who feel discouraged and wish to give up. That's what happens. There's, there's always this temptation to still be religious, but not so devoted and passionate about God and the things of God. I still, I still want to be religious, but, but just enough, just enough. Now, now what, is this, what does this look like today? Well, it's us saying, no, 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 no. On particular issues, no, 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 we love everyone. God loves everyone. The Christian faith loves everyone. And then you stop there. The, the world goes, okay, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, we also love everyone. So you're cool. You're okay. Com completely leaving out what Christ has called us to. Because it's comfortable just to be in this ambiguous middle. I'll give you another one. Yeah, yeah, the Christian faith is about freedom. Be free. Wait, but, but isn't there more? No, no, just God's for freedom. He set us free. Because... Because the world goes, yeah, 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 we should all be free. You should all do whatever you want to do. Yeah, yeah they're, they're cool. That church is cool. They're with us. You're in the ambiguous middle. The, the problem with this 
The problem with this is that when you do that, you treat Jesus like a part-time lover. That's the problem. We treat Jesus like a part-time lover. That's what the author of Hebrews is getting at. You are treating Jesus like a part-time lover. And, 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 and Jesus is not. It's either all of him or nothing. But we do that all the time. It's like, you know what, Jesus, what an incredible Sunday. See you next week Sunday. Like, I, I, no connection with Jesus throughout the week. And so the sum total of your walk with Jesus is quarter past nine, some of you half past nine, until quarter past 11. That's it. And then maybe when you're in trouble, you're like, man, what's that email address again? Prayer at rootedfellowship.com. He is not a part-time lover. He wants all of you. He died so that he might have all of you. This ambiguous middle is, is, it's going to become very, very real for us, especially in South Africa. I feel it. I don't know if you do, but I feel it. It used to be easy to be like, yeah, I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. Now it's like you, even me, sometimes I'm like, how do I say this? How do I, because I know it's going to, you know, and I know I'm going to get that question. I know. But it's really hard for me because it starts with honest. What do you do? Um, so I, um, I work for a church. Oh, you know, you get that. Oh, you can see like they're trying to figure out like, what have I said? Did I use bad language? Did I, whoa, did, what do we, no? It's like, oh, okay. So what do you do? Do you, you know, admin? Do you preach? Do you, no, I, I preach. Okay. What's your take on, and then there we go. <laughs> And it's in those moments I need to be able to speak truth yeah. and love. Yeah. And this is going to become more real for us. If you're a Christian, I just want, I just want to prepare you that the temptation is going, to, is going to want to be in this ambiguous middle. But, but God calls us to be salt and light. Yeah. Amen. Especially for those who are going to be teachers of God's word. Yeah. You're going to be tempted to be like reading passages and going, oh, um... Maybe, maybe let me, we'll get back to, jo- Jonah will do it in the sermon series that's, that's coming, you know, I just, oof. <laughs> Friends, let it not be said of us that we are half in and half out. Yeah, amen. That the world is so comfortable with us because we are so ambiguous. Yeah. Mm. Let us be salt and light. Yeah. Let us be kingdom ambassadors. Because if you're in the ambiguous middle, you are no longer team Jesus. You are team (laughs) Jesus-ish. Let us carry the aroma of Christ. That, that, That makes it so obvious that we are committed to him. Heart, mind, soul, everything. That people see us and they go, those, those are the people that follow Jesus. Yeah. Those are the people that have spent time with Jesus. You know what I'm praying for? I'm, I'm praying, and you guys can be praying this for me. This is for me. If you want it, you can take it. I'm praying that I would have an unoffendable heart. Yeah. Yeah. Now, before you guys panic and be like, oh, I'm going to um, send him an email on Monday. Let me explain. I'm not saying that I, I, I don't want to have emotions. I'm also not saying that I don't care about justice. I do. But I'm praying that God would give me an unoffendable heart because we live now in a context where everything is offensive. Everything. And I don't want to be driven by that. I want to speak truth in love with grace. And then go, God, I'm going to leave the results to you. But we live in a world now where it's like, hey, you know, I don't like the way you put this chair. Oh, so offensive. How could you say that? Don't you care? I'm like, whoa, wait. I just, I just said I don't like the way the chair is. And then because you're so offended, it's now, it's shaping the rest of your day. It's shaping how you interact with other people. You know what should shape the rest of your day? 
the fact that you're a child of God. And so when people say things to you, you're a bigot, you, 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 you hate people, you, 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 you're unloving, you, you, you go, you know what, no, that's, like, no. Whew. I'm a child of God. And I seek to follow God and love God so that I might love others around me and serve them. Let us carry the aroma of Christ. And then the author of Hebrews says this, and we will do this if God permits. This, this, this phrase here, this simply communicates that the Christian's complete dependence upon God. If we do press on to maturity, we recognize that it, it's, it only happens at God's pleasure. The author of Hebrews is simply acknowledging that our sanctification is a work God performs in us by the Spirit. Yes, yes, there is, there is effort that is required on our part, but the fuel comes from God. I mean, why, why would I want to be patient? Why would I want to be good? Why would I want to be kind? Because I've spent time with Jesus, and I'm going, wow, I'm blown away by who he is and what he's done for me. So why would I not want to be kind and patient and loving and hospitable and generous and serving? But when I'm not those things, friends, call me out. When I'm not those things, yeah. ask me, when was the last time you spent time with Jesus? Yeah. Because it's revealing. You, you don't have the aroma of Christ anymore. You stink. You stink of selfishness and pride. And we will do this if God permits. Now to the last bit, which is probably the most controversial. All right? The writer of Hebrews finds it necessary to now address forgery that leads to apostasy. Forgery that leads to apostasy. Apostasy, apostasy is, 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 is the walking away from God, the, the denial of God, the denial of Jesus. And, and he's saying, man, there's, 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 it, it starts with forgery. That you're not the real thing. Let, let me read it. For, for it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God, holding Him up to contempt. Yeah. Uh, these next few verses, they, they bring up the question, can you lose your salvation? Yeah. Oof, now we're getting into some muddy water here. Can you lose your salvation? And, and, and there is lots to be said about this. There is, there's, like we can literally be here for another hour, two hours, just unpacking what this means and why people uh, think this and think that. And, uh, but, but for the sake of time, let me go ahead and tell you where we land here at Fellowship. Our view, and the view of many, we hold to this truth, that those who fall away completely from the faith were never true believers in the first place. Those who fall away completely from the faith were never true believers in the first place, but only appeared to be so. Yeah. They, are, they are people who have received an in-depth exposure to the gospel, but never really surrendered their hearts to Jesus as yeah. Lord and Savior. That, that is a reality. I just want to tell you, that, like, that is a reality. And so because of that, we believe that once saved, always saved. Yeah. And if fallen away, then was never saved. Once saved, always saved. But if fallen away, then they were never saved. Yeah. Let me give you three reasons to why I and we hold to this position, okay? Firstly, the participation in spiritual realities of those who have fallen away, though they have been enlightened and shared and tasted the things of God, matches with the experience of the Israelites in the wilderness. Think about it for a moment. Who fell away and died in unbelief. Being, being part of the covenant community, like they were there. The, the, the fallen Israelites, they put blood on their doorposts. They ate the Passover lamb. They crossed the Red Sea. They saw the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. They tasted the waters at Marah. They, they, they ate manna from heaven. They heard the voice of God at Sinai. They, like they, they experienced all these things. 
And yet their hearts were hardened in unbelief and they fell away from the living God. Now, remember, some of those who perished in the wilderness, were, they were transformed, but, but some of them were not. But both were visible members of the community and therefore shared in the same experiences. And so the author of Hebrews is saying, just like it was for the Israelites in the wilderness, so it is for them and so it is for us. You can, you, you can experience all these things but if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus, you have not been saved. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, Ma Matthew, oof. Matthew 7 says this. From verse 21, it says, this is Jesus speaking. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many, there, I have, it, I have it in a little box there. Many. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you law breakers. He's, he's going, I have, I have no idea who you are. That's, do you know how scary that is? And there's tons of reasons for that. I, I, one of them is I think it's a poor communication of the gospel. And so people don't hear the, the true gospel, the, the, the gospel, the, the, the beauty of the gospel. And, and so they, they end up doing all these things thinking, no, I've surrendered my life to Jesus. No, you haven't. You've surrendered your life to, to a, a practice, to a program, to a system. You have not surrendered your life to Jesus. So that's reason number one. Reason number two. Secondly, Jesus' parable of the soil teaches us that there are people who at the beginning look very much like believers, but they are not transformed. Not only do they look like Christians, but they have remarkable spiritual experiences before they fall away. Just as the seed sown in the rocky places. Matthew 13, verse 20 to 21 says this. The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last they fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. But when trouble comes, they fall away. See, in this parable of the soil, only the fourth soil, the one that bears fruit, reveals the true believers. Again, pointing to the fact that they were never saved. Last one. I'm going to call the band up and, and we're going we're gonna to wrap up. We'll continue next week. The third reason I hold to this view is because I see it in the scriptures. It is one of our doctrines known as the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. It's long, but it's beautiful. The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. This speaks of our eternal security, that if you've crossed the line of faith, if you've surrendered your life to Jesus, then you are secure for eternity. That you will continue to do good works and you will continue to believe in God until the end of your life here on earth. The perseverance of the saints. Yeah. Philippians 1 verse 6 says this, I'm sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 29 to 30. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called also justified and those he justified he also glorified Romans 8 38 verse 39 for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus nothing if you are in Christ nothing will separate you from him but you've got to be in him 1 Peter 1, verse 3 to 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept for you in heaven. Amen. Ephesians 4, 30. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. 1 John verse 
Chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they did not belong to us. For they, if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. However, they went out so that they might, it may be made clear that none of them belonged to us. It's saying that they never belonged. They experienced, but they, but they never belonged. John chapter 10, verse 27 to 28, which is probably the most clearest. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. That once you are in his hand, you cannot be snatched from his hand, but you have to be in. You have to surrender your life to him. And so, so we, we ask this question, can you lose your salvation? I think, I think we, need to, we need to flip that question and, and point it back to God and say, God, can you lose any of your kids? Can you, God? Can you lose any of your kids? Can someone be covered by the blood and then go, you know what, I actually don't want this, and then like scrub all the, the blood of Jesus off them? No, you can't. You can't. And so our, our heart here at Rooted Fellowship is that you would surrender your entire life to him so that you might be secure, that you might persevere to the end. He says, for those who, who try to scrub the blood off Jesus, for those who say you can lose your salvation, that you can go in and out, in and out, in and out, as you please. He says, you are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up to contempt. And you can't do that. We spoke about this a couple of weeks ago. One sacrifice for all, done and dusted. It is finished. He's not coming back to do it again. It's done. And then he gives an illustration for the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it and that produces vegetation useful to those to whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if he produces thorns and thistles, it is worthless and about to be cursed and at the end will be burnt. He says, your life has got to produce fruit. Friends, let's not be immature. Let's not be ambiguous. And let us be the real thing. Let us be the real thing. And so let's call one another to Jesus, our real and true Savior. Friends, I, I spoke about the sacraments as one of the ways of being in the presence of God. And in a moment, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. We do it because it reminds us of what Jesus has accomplished for us. It's for those who've been walking with Jesus to, to go, okay, hey, I just want to remember I want to be reminded of this beautiful truth of why I am so in love with Jesus. We sang this song earlier. I love the hymns. And so we sang this hymn earlier. And I, How great thou art. There's a part in there that says this. It says, when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can't take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. I, I can't get over the gospel. Honor, how do you know that you've been saved? It's because I can't get over the gospel. I, I can't get over the fact that God sent his son to come and die for me. I, just, I, I can't fathom that. I, I shared this with a couple of people um, yesterday that, that if we truly understood what it means to be a, a lawbreaker, that if I got up here and I said, guys, here's what I've done this week. Before Jesus, many of you would have to come to me, carry me outside, and then stone me. Because that was the punishment. And so you know what Jesus does? He, like, like as you guys are gathering around me ready to take me outside, he says, Stop. Punishment must still happen. But you will not punish him today. Take me instead. And everyone stops. Everyone goes, no, hold on. But Jesus, like, you've done nothing wrong. And he says, I know. That is why I'm the perfect sacrifice. Leave him alone and take me instead. And so Jesus was dragged outside for all the public to see and all your sin was thrown upon him. Every single thing that you did was said about him, but he did not do any of those things, but he takes them on. And then he was stoned. 
he was nailed to the cross. I, friends, I can't, I, I can't get over that. That's why I can never get over the gospel. And so if, you, if you're a Christian here this morning, and th- then I, as you come to take communion, look, it's, it's bread and juice. These are simple elements. But what they do is they point to this incredible, beautiful Savior that we have. And as you partake, I just want you to practice by being in the presence of God. And, and if you're not a Christian, then it's an opportunity for you to partake for the first time. That Jesus came and lived the life that you should have lived and died the death that you deserve. And you need a savior. And all you have to do is cry to him and say, Jesus, I need you to save me. I can't do this on my own. I'm not in control of my own life. Everything is falling apart. I need you to save me. And he will answer on that prayer. Then sings my soul, my savior God to thee. Sometimes you just need to tell your soul to sing. Soul, I need you to, like, I need you to sing. How great thou art. How great thou art. And so I'm going to pray for us. And you're going to come up. There'll be a station here. There's a station, two stations at the back. There'll be two elders there. If you want to pray, they'll be there for you to pray pray for them if you want to talk they're there they're there to help and guide and shepherd you in this process the band will play and as you feel led you will come up and you'll take the cup and you'll take the bread and you'll go back to your place or stand around here and you'll, you'll just pray and you know if you are not in awe and and wonder of what Jesus has done then I ask that you would ask him to set your heart on fire for him and sings my soul. And so, Father God, we come to you asking that you would do this great thing. That we we would be so blown away by what you have done for us. That we would be in awe of your sacrifice. Scares can't take it in. Just can't get over the gospel. And so, God, would you move us from immaturity would you call us out of ambiguity? Would, you, would, you, would, you, would we be the real thing, Lord? Would we, would we surrender our whole lives to you? And as we take the bread broken for us as a, a symbol of your body broken for us, and as we take this cup, it's your blood shed for us, pointing to the new covenant would our souls sing. God, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name.